So everybody is looking for something. Can you see that image well enough? <coughs> one of the most practical messages that you will hear, something that ought to resonate with every one of us in a powerful way. Everybody is looking for something. There's an emptiness deep within the soul of every person, and every one of us longs to have it filled. It's a desire that propels us to to want more stuff, to strive for success or prestige, and for many people to recklessly experiment with pleasure, trying to fill the emptiness. You too, in the rhythmic, sing about it that everybody is looking for something. The emptiness within us is actually a God shaped vacuum. <coughs> and though very few people have come to understand what it is they're truly looking for, they're looking for God's presence in their life. They're looking for the fruits of that presence, which is joy, it's peace, and it's contentment. Anyone here doesn't want that? It's what we long for. Without God, a person will, will sputter along, they'll live their life feeling empty, always propelled to try to find and quench that thirst or that emptiness within, but they will not find lasting joy or peace or inner contentment. And so I'm talking to you today, and the man they called the Apostle Paul was writing to followers of Jesus that were living in Philippi. That's why you have on the header of the slides, Philippians. It's his letter to the Philippians, and this is exactly what he was talking about. He used all three words in his letter, some of them even more than others. He says, when we align our life with God, when we allow God the, the space and the place within our lives, then we can know joy. We can know true peace and lasting contentment. But what we don't realize is that in some ways these words are synonymous with one another. They're just different aspects of the same diamond. Contentment is a state of feeling complete, and satisfied. Peace is more than just the absence of conflict or confusion. It's the presence of an inner settledness, a restfulness. And joy, joy is the big word that encompasses the other two. We use the word joy today to kind of uh, refer to exuberance. Um, I just did a wedding on Christmas Eve, or New Year's Eve rather, uh, for Brandon and Christian, and I've never seen this before, but as the bride came down the, the aisle, she was jumping. I mean, she was so filled with excitement. On the platform, while she was taking her phone, she was, I would like, well, I really would. She was, she was filled with exuberance. We would say that was joy, but it's not biblical joy. That's, that's excitement, that's exuberance, it's a wonderful thing. But when the Bible uses the word joy, it's something different in mind. Joy is a deep, really deep state of being content and at peace. That's joy. It's not the same as happiness or excitement. Joy is an inner settledness that even when there is nothing in your circumstances to be happy about, you're still okay. And you feel okay within. That is what we're looking for. Now as for Paul, he was in jail again. He was a bold man who used to speak out in the name of Jesus, proclaiming the gospel, and it landed him in jail. So circumstances, he was in a bad place. But as he told his readers not to worry about him. He said he was good. He said, I'm good, I've got joy, even in jail. You see, because when you have joy, you can rejoice no matter what. He said in Philippians 1 verse 18, continue to rejoice. Even when life is hard, we can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice.
I love Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. We're not talking about sight, we're talking about something far, far deeper and sustaining. Now Paul was mostly concerned that these good people in Philippi, and they were good people, he was concerned that they were wanting to live godly lives, but they were missing out. Even though they were believers, they weren't truly experiencing the joy and the peace and the contentment that God had in mind for them. He said in chapter 1, verse 25, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. I'm going to hang in there until you find this joy that you're looking for. And he tells them that joy and peace and contentment doesn't automatically overtake the believer. The believer has to behave themselves in a certain way. He says, whatever happens, you need to conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. You need to live up to what you've already attained. So just because you're a believer doesn't mean you have the joy or the peace or contentment, but now you're in a position to actually take hold of it. So he goes on to tell them how to live a life filled with joy and peace and contentment. And I don't know if you're interested, but I am. Because I haven't yet arrived. I struggle some days with joylessness. How about you? I'm not always at peace. And sometimes the words of the Apostle Paul, where he says, I've learned the secret of contentment, really get on my nerves. Because I'm not always content. So I'm reading this going, oh boy, this is what I'm longing for. He calls the joyful life the secret of content. We read it today, for I've learned to be content regardless of the circumstances. I know what it is, is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I can do all of this through Christ who gives me strength. So, you're interested? Sure. I mean, seriously, you can, we can go on living our lives, sputtering and never uh, attaining the fullness of what God has for us. That's a choice up to you. But if you want the fullness of what God has to offer, these are the decisions you need to make. And the decisions are yours. Decision number one is adjust your attitude. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. So, we need, according to what Paul said in Philippians, we need to stop having a selfish ambition, but we need to live our lives looking out for the interests of other people. We need to become preoccupied with the well-being of others. And Jesus modeled this. You can read it in Philippians chapter 2, that even while he was with God, he was God, there was nothing for him to attain. He humbled himself and he became a man, taking on the form of a man, he humbled, and a servant, he humbled himself to the point of death. He, he didn't live his earthly life for himself, but he gave it away for others. And we are to follow the example of Christ. Now, which of us has the courage to do that? To let go of our selfish ambitions and to start thinking more about the needs and the interests of others. This is the first decision if you are going to find ultimately what you're looking for. And Paul said you can do it through Christ who gives you strength. The second decision is to change your perspective. <laughs> we can all relate to this picture. Paul says this is tough. This one is really hard. It's like working out your salvation with fear and trembling. This, this is going to cause you to shake as you try to change your perspective. Because most of us live by the value of wanting more than what we have. More, more. And that perspective of wanting more drives us into the swamp of discontent and joylessness. So Paul is saying, instead of looking at what you want to own, and then complaining and grumbling about what you don't have, you need to be thankful for what you do have. If you can change your perspective on what you have and simply be grateful for it, you're on the path. You're on the path. You've changed your attitude, you've changed your perspective. 
Now there's a Russian author, most of us know him by name, Tolstoy. He tells the story of a rich peasant who was never satisfied. He always wanted more. And so he heard of a chance, an opportunity to, to become a landowner. Well, to get more land. For a thousand rubies, or rubles rather, he could have all the land he, 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 could, he, he could find as long as he was able to walk around it within a day. He had to make it back by sundown or lose all his money. So he thought, hmm, I'm going to do this. He gave the thousand rubles. He rose early. He sat up. He walked on and on. His greed, his want, driving him a little bit further and farther as he saw new territory. Finally, he realized that he had to turn back in order to get back before sundown in order to claim what he had walked around. And he began to walk really fast. In fact, he had to begin to scurry and to hurry and become frantic if he was going to make it back before sundown to claim the land. And as the sun got lower in the sky, he quickened his face and he was going at a panic pace. Finally, he saw the starting place and he ran and he ran and he was able to cross the line in time. But he fell to the ground gasping for air. Heart attack, blood coming out of his nose. He was dead. His servant took a spade and dug him a grave. He made it just long enough and just wide enough to bury him. The title of Tolstoy's story is, How Much Land Does a Person Need? And the answer was, six feet from his head to his heels is all he needs. For us, the cost of wanting more, aspiring for more, comes at a great cost. <coughs> More than dollars, it comes at the cost of joy, and peace, and contentment. It consumes us. It says in Philippians 4.19, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So the secret of contentment and finding joy is an attitude change, living for the interest of others, and a perspective change, being thankful for what you have instead of grumbling and complaining about what you don't have. And yet there's more. There's one more decision to make. And I love this one. The other ones I don't like because they're hard. But they're true, and I know they're true. Decision number three. Pursue knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want those words just to soak into you right now. Pursue knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. For many of us, Christianity is a religious thing. Being a Christian means going to church on Sunday. We equate going to church with being with the Christian life. But the Christian life, friends, is twofold. It's not about going to church. It's about knowing Christ. And everything you do, it's about knowing Him. Not just about Him, but knowing Him. Just as I've been your pastor and it's taking me time to get to know you and you to know me personally so that we can be friends and in the, and in the context of, of relationship, over the overflow of, our, of our, our relationship, we can meet in one another's needs and be kind and encourage one another. You need to get to know Christ and about Christ and to know Him personally. And that takes time. Joy, it's the way to joy. And a new acronym is Jesus over you. You need to be soaking in Him. Remember that Paul, Paul Mall of District Church commercial, you're soaking in it, you know? Instead of soaking in all the things that we soak ourselves in during the week, we need to be soaking in, in things that are feeding our soul the presence of God and, and building us up. Make a decision that you want to know Christ. And not only know Him, but you want to experience the power of His resurrection. The same power that quickened Jesus' dead body and made Him alive on Easter. We need to experience that power in our lives. Instead of desiring all the other stuff in this world, we need to desire to experience God, His dunamis power. And how does that happen? 
to the degree that you want to know Christ, you will begin to experience His power in your inner life. We heard, uh, some of the college students will confirm here, we heard the other night about some students that struggle with pornography, Christian students, and they realize that to the degree that they, they avail themselves to that stuff, it's sucking the life out of them spiritually. But as they lay themselves into the Lord and, and soak in, in their relationship with Jesus, the power of, of, of that temptation diminishes and they're experiencing resurrection power in their life to overcome. Some of us struggle with depression. Some of us struggle with a different addiction. Some of us are struggle with pain. Some, whatever you're struggling with, whatever dysfunction, God has something better in mind for you. And as you seek Him, you can also experience that resurrection power in your life. You can only possess what you experience. Truth to be understood must be lived. Too many of us know about Christ, but we haven't experienced it. And He wants you to hunger and thirst for an encounter with His presence and His power so that you can be changed and you can be an overcomer. Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 7, that if you want to experience the peace of God which passes all understanding that will guard and protect your hearts in Christ Jesus, it happens when you set anxiety aside and you pray with thanksgiving to the Lord. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will protect your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You need to put yourself in a position where you can experience the Lord. This is why when I'm driving, I listen to Christian radio. I want to just soak in. And uh, this is why we read our Bibles. This is why we come to church. It's not to become a Christian. It's to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. This is why I invite you to come forward at, at altar times. It's not for for a, a show, it's so that you have an opportunity to, to know Christ and to experience the power of His resurrection. When you step out of your comfort zone and you say, I'm all in, you'd be surprised what God can do in those moments. And by the way, for those of you who stepped forward last week, I promised that I would pray for you every day, and I have. And I hope that you have sensed God's presence in your life. So these three decisions are the path to contentment, the peace of God with you, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. And Paul says elsewhere that godliness with contentment is great gain, and you will be able to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, there is a legend about a rich man, and he had a dumb servant. Pauline, don't look at your children and go, I have dumb children, because they're not. <laughs> she looked at her so went, hmm. All parents think that, but no, our kids are wonderful. There was a rich man who had a dumb son. One day the master got exacerbated with him and he said, You have got to be the most stupid man I have ever met. Look, I want you to take my staff and I want you to carry it with you. <laughs> And if you ever meet another person more stupid than you, you can give him my staff. So the servant took the staff, not feeling too good about himself. And along the way, he met some pretty dumb people, but he wasn't certain that they were dumber than him. So he kept the staff. One day, he was talking with his servant, or his master, and the master said, you know, I'm going on a long journey. Um, I don't think I'm going to be back again. Oh. Well, the servant asked, have you got everything that you need for your journey? The master said, no, not really. I haven't really prepared too much for it. The servant asked, could you have made preparation? Could you have sent something on? Could you have you mean, thought ahead? And the master said, yeah, I guess. I had a long time to do that, but I was just busy about other things. The servant went on, then you won't be back to the castle, the lands, the animals, the servants. No, I'm not going to be back. So the legend concludes that the servant took the staff he'd carried for all his years, and he handed it to his master. And he said, here, you take the staff. 
I fed, finally met a man who was more stupid than I. Do you get it? Do you get it? The Apostle Paul is a very unusual man. We don't get to meet too many people like him. He, he took on the attitude that he wasn't going to live his life for himself. He was going to live his life with the best interests of other people. Him. He took on the attitude that he was going to be thankful for what he had. And not grumble about what he didn't have. And his one desire more than anything else was to know Christ to experience the power of resurrection. And so once in a while we meet a really smart person who has found joy. And I felt obligated to tell you about him today because I have the suspicion that deep down you really want to know the secret of contentment. That deep down you want the peace of God that passes understanding. You want the joy that is your strength and holds you together. I think we could all benefit from a case of the strengths. That was the thought. Forgive us for losing sight of eternal things and putting our trust and our passions and our desires in temple. Help us to change, to let go that which does not benefit us so that we can serve others. These three decisions are hard decisions. That's why you told us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It just goes against every instinct we have inside because we want to make our own life safe and secure. But you've called us to trust you so that you can surprise us by meeting us by meeting our deepest needs and filling that vacuum and that emptiness within. May the gathering place be filled with joyful